Okay, Dashiell Miller here, and um, what do we have? Kuden, that's it. I'm producing so much video these days. Um, I'm, you're lucky I know what day it is. Anyway, all right, so Kuden, what are we, episode 129, and decided to do another Q&A thing. So James is checking in the background to see if uh, anybody already submitted things. I have one loaded up, kind of, right? It's about questions. And I thought this was really, really important because I think this is a widespread uh, kind of mindset, right? I don't know if the mindset is like the, the whole thing suits everybody, but maybe this will relate to you. So we'll talk about it and whatever else comes up in just a minute. So the big question is this, how are self-defense and success-minded people like us Concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world. How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kudan Radio, real training for real people in a real world. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So let's just jump into things. Uh, again, James is checking in the background to see uh, who's sending questions. I think what I said last time was if no questions come in or no one asks any questions during this episode, this will be the shortest episode in the history of Kuden. So um, let me tell you a story before we get started, and then I'll jump into this other thing. Um, one of my teachers uh, that I've been working with uh, for a long time, bunch of years ago, right? Ended up closing his academy or giving it to somebody else. Either way, um, not only was he teaching uh, through his academy, but he was also uh, a police officer and uh, also uh, I think he, he was on the training team, right? So they go out to the range or they do whatever, right? To keep their skills up. And anyway, long story short, um, it's a class night. It's also a training day right? So everything ran late, right? And um, he runs off the range, jumps in his car, races to go to get to class, right? So black belt class is going to be running, right? And so um, uh, does the atypical because he hasn't eaten since lunch uh, or breakfast or something like that, right? Pulls into a drive through fast food kind of thing, right? Shove some food down his gullet, right? Again, gets to the dojo, runs into his office, changes into his uniform, runs out on the floor, still has camo paint on his face, right? From the tra- from the police training during the day, right? Still has this on, whole room full of black belts, right? Runs out and he says, okay, what are we working on? And again, I got this story from him because I wasn't there. Uh, if I were there, I would have whipped out my notebook, which I always carried along. Uh, so I've got pages that have questions about techniques, questions about other things I'm working on, whatever, right? So if I learned very, very early on. The teacher says, any questions? That was an opportunity, right? And I would go, excuse me, whip out that handy dandy notebook and just start with number one. And it, it didn't matter if it were if they were my questions, if they were questions that students had that came up in class and collectively we worked out an answer, but I want to see what my seat, my teacher would say about this, right? So wrote out the question just as the student asked it. And I would ask, ask it during those kind of things as well. So anyway, long story short, just nothing but silence. And he says, you've got to be kidding me. I'm standing in a room full of black belts. No one knows what they're working on. No one has anything specifically that, specific that they're working on. So what did you expect? I was just going to walk out here and toss something out. Well, you're not beginners. He looked around and he said, that's it. I'm done. And with that, he closed his dojo. Thereby leaving the black belts to have to start asking questions to maybe somebody else. Right. Your teacher's a guide, right? They point the way, but this is not Western academic school where they're going to put things out. 
you're going to memorize it for the test. You're going to regurgitate it on the test. And then you can forget about it because you earned the prize. It's not the same. Okay. What are you working on? Where are the holes? Right. And the answer to what are you working on being, well, pretty much everything is bullshit. It's a cop out. What I found over my, what, I've been training in this art for 42 years. Okay. Two thirds of that has been teaching. What I found more often than not is when somebody says everything, they're working on nothing. Okay. Or they're just hunting and pecking. Okay. So, I mean, we give our students workbooks, right? Covers six months worth of training, three belt levels, right? Give or take six months, depends on the student, right? And so by the time they're at the end of that, four to six months in, getting ready to graduate out into another module or another black belt level, so we're talking one to two years in, something like that, right? Um, they should have a list out of that workbook, out of that material. They should have a list of things that they're pretty confident in. Unless the teacher mentions something, they're pretty confident in, right? So that stuff, if we see it, we're, we're having them work on it in class. If we see that and they're doing 80% of perfect or better, right? Then we give them the next step, right? Here's a variation to that. Here's another way you can do it. Here's another way to look at it. Here's another little detail. Great, right? But they should have a list of those. They should have a list of things that they've seen, they're working on, but, mm, okay, this needs some work. Okay, great. And they need a list of things that they either haven't seen or don't remember having seen. It's the same thing, right? Because we also have an instructor lesson plan that runs monthly. And so I can check someone's attendance card. Yes, we have those as well. Attendance card to the lesson plan. And somebody can say that they never were never taught something. But more often than not, that comes down to I don't remember learning it. Or I don't come to class often enough that I caught things consistently. And so if we match it up and we go, I eh, no, see, we taught this, this, and this on the days that you were. Okay? So, but they should have a list, right? So during that last review stage, before they were getting ready to move to the next level, they should have a very finite list of things to work on um, because they're keeping track of things, right? So, but... Again, one of the traps we can fall into, and I'd like to say what all self or all personal development uh, gurus say, it's not your fault, right? That's part of a sales pitch. It's not your fault, right? Um, you know, we're going to fix that. We're going to move on. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it isn't. But in this case, maybe it's not, right? Maybe it's not your fault because you were indoctrinated into an educational system that spoon fed you very specific things that were going to be on the test. Right? That's why students ask all the time, right? Will this be on the test? Right? What's the implication? If it's not going to be on the test, you'll be lucky if I don't just tune out in class and not pay attention to a damn thing you're saying. Right? This is self-protection. This is life mastery. It's all a test. Right? So anyway, there's that. Okay. So, but I want to start off with something, right? Um, James will let me know after I do this whether or not actual questions came in. But uh, Friday, and I'm not, I'm not going to name names because I think this is global enough that it's not necessary, right? But I received uh, a messenger, a, a message on Facebook Messenger, right, from um, somebody that uh, comes in from for like our virtual Friday virtual uh, training. Uh, he's been on other seminars when I do. Uh, free things, these, that, whatever, right? As much as possible, as much as the schedule allows, um, I see them quite a bit. So anyway, so uh, Friday, I received this thing. It was uh, Friday morning, my time. But this is based on, I think, the statement I made during last episode's coup day, which was, again, as a refresher, for those of you checking in late, um, this was going to be an open Q&A. And I wasn't going to be preparing anything. So if students didn't come with questions, this is very much like my teacher. I'm not going to close the dojo. But, um, you know, if you don't come with questions, then this is going to be the shortest episode in the history of Kuden. So 
Anyway, so I don't count this as me having a topic. This was something that I told him after we had our little exchange. Great questions, great topics. This would make a great one for Kuden. But since we're doing Q&A and because of the topic, um, I think I'll lead off with this. Right. So anyway, he says, sir, I've discovered that as I listen to your instruction, I'm creating a list of further learning uh, I need to focus on. I know that many questions I may have in the moment of initial teaching will be answered by my study. So I stay quiet when you ask for questions. I may not be the only one experiencing this. I wonder if this helps. Also wish me a nice day. Anyway, so uh, my answer was, was fairly simple, right? I understand the perspective and the patience, okay? Just a thought. How much more could you achieve if you had the answer or a different perspective sooner, right? Sooner than it was going to take you to figure it out. Because I trust everybody here with enough determination and diligence, you're going to figure it out, right? Most of us have that mindset, right? Trouble goes on in our lives, significant other or family or whoever, right? They're all wigging out and you just put your hand up and go, just, just calm down, right? I'll take care of it. Well, how are you going to take care of it? At the moment, I don't know, but I'll figure it out because one of our character traits is confidence in our ability to solve the puzzle. We will figure it out. Okay. Um, so I said, my goal is to get you the results faster than it took me. And this is an important piece, right? Because while people have a list of, right, well, why, why do you have a teacher? Well, because they know the stuff and I want to learn it, right? Um, they can check me as I'm learning things, right? Uh, all kinds of reasons, right? Um, sometimes it just makes them feel all warm and fuzzy because they can say that so-and-so is their teacher or uh, whatever, right? I mean, sometimes it's just a connection to the lineage, some whatever, right? But I believe that uh, the number one reason for having a mentor or mentors, right, is to get where you're going faster, right? Because they can help you make adjustments. Because what if what you figured out was based on half the information you needed, right? You've been working on a technique. You're trying to make it work and it's working okay, but teacher walks over and goes, oh, don't forget to put your knee against their shin so that you can catch that little leverage and keep them off balance. Oh, crap. I didn't even see you do that. Oh, yeah, that's an important piece, right? So, but either way, right, you're figuring things out, but what if what you're figuring out is only half to two thirds of what you actually need, right? I trust that with enough study, you'll figure it out, right? But the role of a mentor, of a teacher, right, is to make the journey easier, to make it faster than theirs was, right? Because if they've been, if they've been continuing to grow, and here's here's the thing about skill sets, right? Uh, when I first started off, right, my my goal was to never live in fear like I did growing up, right? Because of the way that thing that kind of thing happened, right? So it's about not living in fear. Concurrently, I decided also, well, becoming a police officer and learning, not this stuff, I was learning a bunch of other martial arts um, kind of along the way, starting in what was then junior high school. Um, I was working on that, but the choice to become a police officer, right, in my head at the time, right, was would also make me more safe because I get other types of training. I'd legally be able to carry a weapon. Uh, authority, respect, all those kind of things, right? So I, I take that route. Also, there was that that need or drive to be in a position to protect other people who were dealing with the same kind of violence and, and issues and things like that that I grew up with, right? So I had this altruistic kind of thing as well. So I started doing that, right? And then I realized that I'm always going to be last on the scene, right? I mean, in seven years, I can count on one hand how many times I was there when the actual violence was occurring. It was always a response mode, never a proactive mode, right? So I made the choice to help other people, right? Well, you know, I took the same route everybody else does, right? 
I have a black belt or I have whatever this this uh, knowledge is, right? So I'm just going to start conveying it. And then I realized there's a lot I don't know about teaching because I'm, I'm only presenting things the way I learned it. Some people are getting it. Some people are not. Some people are leaving, all that. So I had to develop. So the next phase in my transition was learning how to effectively um, teach different personality types, different learning types, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, that starts to grow a training group and that training group starts to get bigger and more unwieldy because we started off teaching uh, training either in uh, a back outside back area of my military police unit or once I get out of the military, then, you know, my yard or a park or whatever. And now, you know, weather and all these kind of, so now, okay, oh, let's, let's open a dojo. Yeah, let's do that, right? Lots of people have a goal. If I want to teach and I want to, I want to run a dojo, okay? What's your skill set? Well, I'm really good at martial arts. Okay, great. What about marketing and recruitment and um, how you, you can call it sales. We call it lead conversion, right? Where you're explaining the program in a way that not just, it's not about convincing them to join because if you convince somebody to do something, they can just as easily be convinced to do something else later on, right? But how do I explain it in a way that lets them determine whether or not this is a good fit for them, right? And at the same time, I can disqualify people that are going to be crappy students, right? Without being like SS Gestapo kind of, uh, you know, personality, right? So that's a whole other skill set. There's a whole bunch of skill sets in there lesson plans and making sure that, um, you know, people are, you know, moving and getting what they need incrementally. Did a lot of my teachers do that? Hell no. Right. But this is the, this is the thing that's needed so that I can make sure the rent's paid so that there's a great place to, you know, for students to come and train, right. The bills don't get paid. I'm not going to be helping very many people for very long. And I don't want a butt ton of people coming to freaking to my house, to my garage, to my basement, to my backyard, whatever. Um, I know these people by name and they seem like nice people, but that's about the extent of it, right? So there's that, right? And then, right, there are these different transitions, right? Uh, transition to online and then having another skill set of having to learn uh, tech and having to be able to convey things where I can't grab you and go, mm, that's where your body goes, right? Um, or having to uh, convey things or teach things in a way where the student takes on the responsive, some of the responsibilities that the teacher has in an actual brick and mortar uh, martial arts academy, right? So all those kind of things, right? So there, there's a lot of things that go beyond that, but either way, my goal as a teacher, I think any teacher's job, whether they acknowledge it or not, is to get a student from A to where they are, because they can't get anybody beyond that, right? from point A to where they are quicker than it took them, right? And any instructor that complains because students are dropping like flies and they're just not committed enough or whatever, um, well, I would say I don't know what to tell you, but I'll tell you the same thing I tell all my instructor candidates um, before, at, right up front, first lesson, okay? Every class you teach, a student is either one one step closer to the next belt level or progress level or whatever, or one step closer to the door. Does that mean that there are not, un, you know, students with no commitment or whatever? No, of course not. But before we write them off to that, how about if we take a personal assessment and, and check ourselves and check our ego at the door, right? That kind of thing. But anyway, let's get back to, uh, to what the student had sent in, right? So he said, after I said, you know, uh, again, another good topic, whatever, he said, thank you, good questions, great, good answers. Um, and then, because I remember I asked him, uh, uh, how much more could you achieve, right? How much farther down the line would you be if you had the answer or a different perspective sooner, right? So he said, sooner sounds great, but fully sounds better to me. I feel like I struggle with comprehension and implementation. So we'll focus on those kinds of questions moving forward, right? And again, here's that need for or, or reason for a mentor, right? In today's world, I, I don't think there's a technique that exists on any of the scrolls 
that you can't find being taught by how many teachers on YouTube or Vimeo or whatever, right? You can get all that stuff, right? So do you really need a personal one-on-one -on -one teacher to teach you that stuff? Well, I mean, aside from who's doing it right, who's missing something, whatever, right? Sooner or later, like I said, sooner or later, you figure, figure it out. Um, but he brought up something really important here, okay? Comprehension, but the big word is implementation, okay? Students come to me not because they can't find the information all over the place, but because I can speak their listen and I can make things, I, I can help relate things to their lives, right? Their learning type, their um, their personality, those kind of things, right? Their background. And so we can move from there. And so what we're really doing is tailoring the training to them, right? So they can learn faster, okay? But the implementation, right? It's that accountability, right? If you're supposed to be sending in review videos to me at certain times and I'm not getting them, then you and I both know. I may not know whether or not you're practicing, but I do, do know whether or not you're committed to knowing whether or not you're progressing correctly or not, okay? So anyway, it's that implementation, right? So he says, so I'll focus on those kinds of questions moving forward, right? Comprehension and uh, implementation, right? Uh, so that's why I had the note taking earlier. Uh, I just gave him a thumbs up, right? Uh, conversations with you are always multifaceted. I can't appreciate that enough. Now I'm thinking, why do I have to choose just one, right? One side or the other of the coin he was talking about. There's a mentality I'm missing. What would create both? My answer was typical male, one word, practice. Okay? So mindfully remembering that I tend to lean over here, right? And I tend to get really egghead or geeky about it or whatever, right? And I'm being all intellectual about it, which is great, or whatever it is, right? Maybe I'm just overdoing the physical practice and I keep doing the same stuff the same way. Every time I do a kata, every time I do a technique or whatever, it's exactly the way I learned it in the beginning, whether it was white belt or whenever I learned it, right? But if I'm like four levels down and I'm still practicing or still executing the same technique the exact same way, and I haven't integrated other principles and concepts and things like that into what I, into the technique based on the difference, right? Because remember, when we first started, we thought we knew everything then too. Okay? Or we knew we didn't know anything, right? So we learned the techniques, and then when we learned it enough to get the teachers okay or the new belt or whatever, what ends up happening? Stop practicing it, right? Or at the very least, in our head, we check the checkbox, right? And we assume that we've got it. And then you move to another block of training and you learn some new principles and concepts, balance control and timing and distancing and angling and all that kind of stuff. But the brain tends to compartmentalize things. So that, well, see, that's only for those techniques. No, it's for those techniques. And now we need to go back to the other ones and upgrade them. Same thing, move on to mod three or whatever your next level is with whoever you're teaching or learning from, right? And we learn new principles and concepts and we pick up other things about distance control and all that kind of stuff, right? But that's only for these. Things. No, we need to go back to the previous one and the one before that and upgrade them, right? So everything changes, right? It stays the same, but you just gain more and more and more control. But if we keep, if we keep doing things the same way, that would be like, you know, I learned how to... Um, ride a two-wheel bicycle, um, got the teachers or my parents or whatever, okay, that, yay, that's great, okay? Um, but then, then what do I do? Well, see, I kept the the uh, bike with the training wheels, right? And I got a new bike, right? I, got, I kept the bike with the training wheels, and I kept the tricycle that I learned on. So now, what? When I change bikes... 
I'm going to leave the training wheels on or I'm going to ride a tricycle. Okay? It's supposed to be upgrading as ability upgrades, balance and all that kind of stuff, right? You imagine, right? I'm not going to throw away my tricycle. I might want to ride, ride that sometime, right? You're three times too big for the tricycle. Uh, that, you don't mess with the tricycle. Okay? Same thing with training wheels, right? Training wheels are supposed to come off, right? Not stay on and then just get a new bike that doesn't have them. I might want to ride the bike with the training wheels again. That's what people do with kata all the time. Okay? There's no upgrading to go along with skill proficiency. So what ends up happening is they say, stay the same skill proficiency with every new technique they get. Right? Except that they're not really doing that either because they stop practicing the old stuff unless they teach because now they have a reason to know it. But everybody else is looking for the next shiny object, the next shiny kata, right? And then the other stuff that are still options for surviving a, an attack, they just get old and rusty. And Anyway, so um, that was just a little exchange that I had with just uh, one person. I thought it would be a, a good way to lead these things off. And... Um, I don't know. At the same time, maybe make sure that we don't have the shortest Kuden episode in the history of Kuden. We might still could, as uh, some of the people that I knew when I was in North Carolina um, used to say. Anyway, um, James, did you find any? Who am I saying hi to? Hello. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Lee, Phil. Carl all said hi. Hey guys, our regulars. And Carl said this wasn't a prepared question, but he says the group I am training with is not Bujinkan or Ninjutsu based. Having okay. a conundrum where I am having to show their techniques, which are similar but different to ours. Muscle memory issues as I subconsciously do what I have done for years now. This is more prevalent when showing technique or drilling. No issues yet with randori or sparring as I just use our tactics and strategies and disguise the techniques or use our tactics to set up their techniques. Okay. Was there a question in there? I don't Read think it's a specific again. question. Okay. So I I this is this is a, a this is a this is a common thing at high levels, okay? And so where Carl is right now, Carl's been training for a long time. He's also, um, he's a police officer. So this is stuff that that comes up on a regular basis. So uh, two perspectives two perspectives to this or on this, right? Um, because our focus is on natural movement, I'm going to say and not stylized movement, but a lot of people would argue because of what they see at the lower levels. But if you watch the Daishihan move around, Megatsu Sensei, Hatsumi Sensei, all these guys, right? Shrey Sensei, okay? Um, when they're teaching a kata and they're introducing it to you, you're going to see the form that everybody's used to, the style, right? But otherwise, they're moving around in Shizentai, okay? So, and this is what I learned was right and proper and I when I was a white belt okay um so but because we're focusing on natural movement let me get back to the original thought before because we're focusing on natural movement and freedom of movement and balance and all that kind of stuff right it becomes easier for us to learn new systems very quickly and I mean like 80 to 90 percent uh proficiency very quickly because we're more able to adapt our body to what to what's needed, right? Um, that's more difficult for people who are very, very strict stylists, right? Uh, hard style, whatever, right? Um, and so that kind of stuff gets into muscle memory, and then they need to do something outside of that, and it it's it's really difficult, right? I've seen that when people from uh, like hard karate, or I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just kind of, this is based on memory, right? Hard karate styles, taekwondo, those kind of things. When they come, when they've come to seminars or they've gone to Japan, um, 
I remember even early on, right, because of the styles that I had learned, um, how my body kept defaulting to those kind of things, right? Um, and also the mentality, right, that there's only one right way to do it kind of thing, right? So this is this is on one side where, where folks have a hard time doing that. Um, but I could see where Carl, it, it, it should be, I'm assuming you're, you're having the same kind of uh, thing where the moves themselves, right? As long as we're going at slower speeds, that kind of thing, right? 70, 80% of it, you can pick up pretty quickly, right? doesn't matter what other system you go to learn because your body is adaptive, right? Um, it also becomes very, very evident when something is not tactically or strategically sound given let's say, I'm just going to keep it simple with a modern context. It may have worked in ancient China, ancient Korea, whatever, because of the types of attacks and all that, right? Just like with our stuff, right? If you stick to kata, right? Anything's easy when you got a straight line attack and you can hit your angle because you only have to remember one, right? Naname is naname, right? Turn that into an uppercut or a hook or, a, you know, an uppercut that's coming up at a 30, 45 degree angle, whatever, right? Everything changes, right? Everything changes. The lesson doesn't change, but what the technique looks like changes, right? Um, without becoming something different, right? So, um, so there's that on that side, right? But on the other side, right, because you've spent all this time learning this stuff, as the adrenals kick in and as things get faster and all that, you're going to default, Right to that which you do well right it's just it's just natural but here's here's the here's the uh, here's the thing right i got this both from uh ninpo teachers uh hatsumi since they said it uh the big one that stands out was uh i think it was the 1998 taikai in princeton new jersey Either way, right? Uh, Nagato since or Manaka since I had just shifted away and formed the Genincon, and a bunch of people wanted to train with that because he was really hyper focused on basics. The whole premise to the Genincon in the early days was people's basics were crap, right? Um, and so he just heavily focused on that, right? So at this Taikai, Hatsumi Sensei is talking about how much people need that. You need it. Right. He wasn't bad mouthing Manaka or anything. Right. You need that. Right. So if you can get it, great. However, at a certain point in your training, at a certain rank, right, to not become confused, you need to pick a teacher. I got the same thing from my Mikio teacher, Reverend Jikai. Right. You can, you can study all kinds of things. Right. You can study with whoever, whenever, or whatever. But at a certain point, Part of it's because of tradition and being a, a member of the lineage. Part of it is because your teacher knows you so well that they can explain things and speed up the process, the learning process, right? So, but either way, right? You have to pick, right? You have to pick a teacher and a path, right? You're going to get everything anyway, but you, you need to pick, right? So uh, I think at that point, the, the rank was fifth on, but eventually that probably translated into somewhere between eighth and 10th on. But um, either way, right? So you have all this stuff going on. Um, and I get it, right? I mean, you're, you're, you've are you been cross-training for a long, long time. And I find no fault in that at all. But I think what you're finding is that the principles and concepts that have worked well for you, right? They're... They're naturally coming out, but they're also making it difficult for you to teach a different system without this influence coming in, which, by the way, is the same thing historically that happened as Soke of the nine lineages that, you know, that's all I have to operate on, right? The nine lineages that Hatsumi Sensei inherited um, as they met and they shared notes and things like that, right? They dropped certain things and picked up on other things. Um you know, people have no idea how how much of a Tagagi Yoshin uh, influence 
runs throughout the the Bujinkan, no matter how much people want to separate out Yoko, Koto, all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, think about the, the current generation Soke. Their Soke of given lineages, but how can they forget all of the synthesized training they've gotten for how many decades? It's going to be very difficult for them to be passing on Gyoko, Gyoko style, pure, as though it were post or pre Takamatsu. It's always going to have the flavor of the other lineages, no matter what anybody says. All right? Then they be able to be able to be may be able to split things out, state to certain principles, concepts, and whatnot. Right when they're teaching and they're they're introducing people to very specific set things, and you're doing soft training, but as the adrenals kick in, they're not going to be able to keep it separated. So you're running into the same thing. So, uh, and I can see where the problem is is happening with drills and those kind of things because, right, you it's not slow, it's not structured, it's right, it's more loose. There's more variables going on. There's more stress and pressure going on. So you're going to default to that which tactically and strategically works, um, you know, works for you. So anyway, and I know it wasn't a specific question, but um, that, that, was a, that was a good topic because people run into that kind of stuff all the time. Um, and also the other, the flip side of that is people don't study the art or the system enough, right? So um, for decades, I've heard from people in Japan, right? Uh, they only train with Hatsumi Sensei. They only train with Hatsumi Sensei, right? I'm Hatsumi Sensei student, except that Hatsumi Sensei um, didn't acknowledge that, right? There was a whole period of time that Hatsumi Sensei stopped taking personal students, right? And they fell into that kind of thing. So what they were doing was only going to Soke's class or classes and then conflating that with I only train with Soke. That's one thing, but I'm a personal student of MC. That that's all something altogether different, right? But what they were also doing, because ego needed to only train with Soke, only go to the source, right? They weren't training with any of the the other master teachers, who themselves were specialists at certain lineages, right? I don't know if how many of you know that in the late '60s, early '70s. Uh, somewhere in that time frame, right? Um, Hatsumi Sensei almost died from, it was either stomach or in, uh, intestinal, whatever, um, cancer, okay? Um, really, really, really sick, right? Thought he was going to die, right? And during that time, what he did so that nobody would get everything, he taught those people that you all know as master teachers, he taught them one or two of the nine lineages, and that was their specialization, okay? Oguri-san, Sano-sensei, uh, Nagato, Manaka, whatever, right? That became their thing, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, he survived and whatnot. But the, all these people, the, their, their movements are very, very specific to that kind of thing because back then, right, everything was very cut and dry for nine schools, right? But throughout time, right? All of his stuff, right, just got, it just changed, right? I watched this development. I mean, I, I got on board in 1980, late 80, early 81. And, you know, people tend to think that things are what they are when they jump on board. So they make the assumption it's the way they see it is the way it's always been. So that's the correct way, right? Meanwhile, back at the dojo, those of us who were on from almost the beginning watched things change and watched phases happening right um as hatsumi sensei was as he was growing those of us who got on early right were taken through phases of growth right but anyway so um there's lots to this but i can see um where the frustration and whatnot um, can be coming in or where there might be little glitches and, and things like that so um i don't know if this is possible where you are but um you could do the same thing that Hatsumi Sensei uh, has always done when it came to teaching kata, right? I don't know if anybody noticed, but Hatsumi Sensei's uh, kata, really, really sloppy, right? 
somebody to teach kata or whatever, and then he would step in to teach henka, and so somebody would throw a punch or whatever, and he would just shift back. He was bladed, but he was in shiza, and, and his arm was just kind of catching and whatnot. He was not in the crisp kind of form that everybody learns in the early stages of their training, and I believe that that's right and natural. I'm not saying that he had sloppy taijutsu. I'm talking about sloppy form, and it's because he was in the uh, – not just the principle and concept level, but in the essential, the, the kotsu, the essence level, right? So for him to do set kata, right? A lot of us talked about this over the years, right? It would have crippled his abilities, right? So it's right and natural to grow beyond that. So what he's always done at seminars or at hombu or whatever is... When he wants somebody to teach a kata from the scroll, right? There were years where we worked on, ding, ding, right? Work on these kata. He would have somebody who was an accomplished practitioner, but was closer to that level, come out and perform the technique that way. And then he would step in and look at tactics, strategies, right? more of the principles and concepts, adaptation, and those kind of things. So I don't know if that's possible for you, but that might be a way around the conundrum. If there's somebody in class or you already have an assistant who's more, they're not more, maybe that's the only the only style they know or whatever, right? That's the only system they know. So if they're more, at, more adept at the, the perfect model, right? then have them demonstrate that. And then you step in afterwards and start pointing out, okay, look at this. Here's, here's something that can happen. So we're going to, we're going to use this, right? We're going to, we're going to, we, we can do it this way, that kind of thing. Right. And you can start throwing in, you can do the variation and the higher level stuff, the tactical strategic kind of stuff that you're already very adept at pulling, as you say, our stuff into that. But, you know, um, you can also, from the outside, know if they're sticking to their style when they're doing drills or run dory or whatever. So you can you can coach from the outside, but then you can also step in and go, okay, let me, let me show you something here. Okay, so here, 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 right? This style kind of shows it like this, but I want you to think about this, right? And then do that thing that you're already very, very adept at, right? So unless you're con constrained by some kind of... Um, license, certification, written agreement, contract, or whatever, and which, come on, man, right? I mean, how much can they actually regulate that kind of stuff? Um, I don't live in Australia, but either way, right? But just some ideas for for working around the thing, right? So uh, that's, that's what Soke did, right? So um, anyway, I don't know. Hopefully this was helpful. Anything else? Uh, James, anything come in from uh, Carl while I was talking or anything from anybody else? I don't know if this was valuable for anybody else, but um, if you're in that uh, in a similar um, circumstance, right, just think about it. Uh, Sensei McLaurin sent in a question. Of course he did. He, I bet he's not online either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start saving this stuff for last. That way, if we don't get to it, then he'll know how I feel. <laughs> you want his question or do you want me to hold it? Sure, why not? Uh, Carl just said it was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And since email Lauren said, yes, I am still on. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. He says. He was all, all butthurt because he missed a class last night that I was teaching at university. And, and now he's going to try to like weasel his way into the next one, which is good ninja like. But like, you know, next time they'll send me a message that says, hey, next time, tell us so we don't miss out. Hey, next time, be a ninja and gather some information. <laughs> what am I missing today, sir? <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll, I don't know. Maybe I'll upset him enough that I want to take me out. Uh, and I don't mean for dinner. Right. Uh, I mean, like, you know, smack me when I'm not looking in class. Anyway, all right, what's this question? How do you remember all the different names for each technique without getting them confused? I don't. I have notes. 
nine schools, not counting, not counting ancillary schools that were absorbed into the Bujinkan. Okay. Like the Kukishinden style, right? Or Kukishinden school, right? Has the uh, influences from uh, an old code you called Ito Ryu, right? Uh, all these things, right? The Musashi Ryu is, is in there and stuff. Not one of the nine, right? All these things, right? So I have notes. I have, you know, list of kata on there. You'll hear me in class, right? I'll, I'll say something and uh, call something a name and then come back, you know, a couple minutes later and go, ah, that's not that name. It's this name, right? James, you've heard me say that in class, right? Okay. Or I'll say, I don't mm -hmm. remember what that's called. So uh, for today's class, we're going to call it Sono Kata, right? Sono Kata means what? That thing, right? Oh, and before you think that's not official and I'm just making a jack wagon joke, in the, in the uh, Gyoko Scrolls, there is a list of 10 kata. The odd numbers are on the left side. The even numbers are on the right side. They're called the Sono Kata. Sono Kata Ichi, Sono Kata Ni, Sono Kata San. This thing number one, this thing number two, this thing number three, right? Um, uh, and that's how I got it through the Manaka den anyway, right? So um, I have things from Jinin Khan, I have things from Genbu Khan, I have obviously lots of things from Bujin Khan, but um, I didn't, I, I don't, I don't take a political stance when it comes to um, who's right and who I, I should be learning from or whatever. And maybe that makes me an, you know, bad student or an outsider or whatever. But um, from the very beginning, my life, my path, my ability to protect my family and keep them alive should danger occur or whatever, to decide who I'm only going to learn from them because these people are wrong by default because what? That person left under bad terms, that person left under good terms, That, but either way they left, right? So they're traitors. Kiss my, anyway, I won't finish that, right? I mean, how much like a three-year-old can we act? Anyway, kind of remind, speaking of three-year-olds, um, some of you have been following on YouTube and whatnot, you know that I've just been cranking out a ton of video lessons, a lot of shorts and all that, right? Somebody uh, a day or two ago, uh, I, I followed his stuff, right? He, he must be some kind of survivalist or, I don't know, gold prospector or one or whatever, based on the, the couple of videos that he has up. No martial arts stuff or whatever, right? Some 20, early 30-something um, tough guy, right, that to sum it all up, told me to shut the hell up and stop teaching because he'll come and kick my ass. And it'll be so bad that Either way, right? Um, that's what I deciphered through poor grammar, poor spelling, and a run-on sentence that lasted about, I don't know, four or five sentences worth. Anyway, I mean, how difficult is it in the 21st century to unsubscribe from an email list, from YouTube videos, to whatever? But the irony is his comment came in the wake of a lesson that I was, that I was just a little, a little one minute short, right? A lesson I was doing on uh, making sure that you're paying attention to legal considerations when you're learning self-protection. And here's Jack Wagon threatening my well-being and leaving evidence or leaving evidence online. Thanks for proving my point. Anyway, then somebody else, uh, I don't know if anybody caught the little short that I did on one of my guys from way back in the day that uh, he and some friends were coming out of the mall and they got jumped and one of the guys had a knife. And anyway, he did his thing, right? Well, this guy whose name I think is something like Snot Booger or something like that, right? That's his online handle, right? So I'm going to take him seriously anyway, right? But what he said was, well, you know, a, a pistol would have made short work of that to begin with. It was less than a one minute video. And about three quarters of the way in. So what we're talking, you only had to listen for like 40, 45 seconds, maybe. Right. And I said he didn't want his dad to find out. Right. And we made this little joke out of it and all that kind of stuff. Right. 
if you're worried about your dad and you're between 18 and 21 or whatever is legal in your area to carry a handgun, right? I wouldn't have made that statement, right? So the very fact, sure, a pistol would have made short work of it, right? Unless it's just the guy with the knife and you with the gun. And the only person that can say what really happened is dead. Again, not thinking through very well. So, okay. just like there was a story in the Bujan Cup. Well, not a story. <laughs> this was an activity. And some of the master teachers involved, are uh, uh, engaged in this as well, coming up through the ranks. Um, well, they would go to train stations. And um, if they saw a Yakuza punk who was trying to make their bones, right, to move up the ladder, uh, trying to recruit a schoolgirl, or they were mugging like a bystander or whatever, right? They beat the shit out of them and then disappear. Okay. And then the lesson was you never kill them. Not a good idea. Because what's going to end up happening is the whole freaking Yakuza clan is going to go hunting. Right. So if you beat them up, they got their ass kicked once by you. And then they got to hobble back to the clan. And they're going to pay back there too. Because they let somebody else, a civilian, kick their ass. But if you kill them, see, and that goes for any self-defense situation, if at all possible, which is why a lot of our stuff ends in restraints and all that, right? It's never a good idea to kill a bad guy. Okay? There are certain conditions, but never it's not a good idea, right? One, it helps with your, your self-defense uh, claim, right? Because when they start pointing out what kind of a high-level practitioner you are, you can point out, yeah, could have killed them didn't okay stay within use of force okay but two you're gonna if you're if you're just you and him in a back alley or wherever it happens to be in your house or whatever right the only other witness to the event if they're dead man that's a tough position to be in yeah, but he could lie. Yeah, but he can also be caught in a shit ton of lies too. Okay? So, right? Taxes and strategies go way beyond your cool step by step moves. Okay? And tell, tell you guys the same thing I've always told my teenagers when they come up with their ideas and they were getting themselves in trouble. I would say the problem here is. You don't think big enough. You can't see outside of your own little bubble. Because until you can do that, you can't make better decisions. You can't make decisions that last outside the moment. Anyway. All right. So um, where do we springboard off of that one? Um, boom, 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 boom. Oh, that was, uh, that was Chris's, right? Boy, I really took right. that down freaking side street, didn't I? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, I don't. I've, I've got notes, right? I will look it up if I'm preparing for a camp or whatever, and and those names are important or we're specifically drilling into, let's say, the Gyoko Yu Joriyaku uh, no Maki or Tagagi Shodan, whatever, right? Then if that's important, I just go look it up. I just make sure that I'm I have that kind of thing right. Right. There are nine schools, again, not counting these other things. That's where I derailed. Right. You got nine schools and each of those schools have at least three scrolls. And each of those scrolls has between five and twenty three kata. Dude, if you think I've memorized all those. Right. Um, well, I won't tell you to stop smoking whatever you're smoking, but um, it's just it's not important. Right. I just told somebody that tonight. Uh, in class, well, it, um, it, it doesn't matter who I told, but uh, actually, this was a Shidoshi Malmstrom. We, we used to call them Buddhisms because his nickname was Bud because he didn't like his first name, right? So instead of Buddhism, he called all these little one liners they had Buddhisms, right? And one of those things was somebody would somebody be working on a technique or whatever, and um, 
I'd say, what, 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 what's the kata name? What, what's the name of this kata? And he'd go, what's the matter? You can't do it, right? I don't care if you call it Fred or Bob or Susie Q. I don't care as long as we're on the same sheet of music, right? By, by worrying about things that have nothing to do with your skill proficiency, you, you're just wasting time. It's like these people that get on and do ment mental gymnastics or he used to call it mental or, uh, uh, theoretical or ma mental masturbation or whatever, right? Um, on these forums or, or whatever, right? Um, at a certain point, sometimes, sometimes you can look at the name of the kata and learn more about why it's called that way or what they're pointing to or whatever. But until you can do the moves, it doesn't matter. Noguchi said they used to do that because the kata collectors would be in Japan training and he'd show something, right? And it doesn't matter if it was a kata, variation, whatever. Here, here's this thing, right? Here's this, could have been an exercise in freedom of movement, right? And they would go, oh, uh, uh, which, which, uh, which scroll and which lineage is this on? He just stopped and go, doesn't matter. You can't do it anyway. Train. Right? People get themselves all in a freaking wiki about, you know, the names of things. Sometimes they matter. Sometimes they don't. But what does it matter if you can't do it? Just like when people want to know, when would I use this one? There's a time to ask that question when you're first learning it and you can't figure out, the, you can't keep the step-by-step -step parts right. That's not the time. Yeah. Everybody wants to know, everybody wants to know the answers. Like that's going to somehow make them better. It may long-term, right? But usually what, what's happening is ego is asking the question. So ego can short, shortcut the process. Be half-assed about the technique, but sound like it's already a master. Okay. Anyway, so um, the short answer back again, uh, Chris, is I don't. Right? I don't have them all memorized. The ones that, that what, what what it the way this may come across to you, and why what the reason it might sound like. I've got all these names stuck in my head, right? And I can keep them straight is because I've been teaching for how long, right? And I've gotten people to first degree black belt. Some people have gone beyond that or whatever, but not consistently enough. The names you keep hearing are fairly lower level or the kata in fairly lower levels because I'm teaching them more often. So the names are top of mind. But I don't have all of them. Not by a long shot. Okay. Uh, next. Now we're getting some traction. <laughs> Actually, in relation to that, Sensei Golem said Yujaku was Koku for the longest time. And Ujaku. of course, everyone... Yeah. And of course, everyone has their gun on them at all times. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the first lessons I teach in our um, uh, first level uh, gun defense course, right, um, is we have four pillars, four training areas, four study areas, because there's different situations that you, you need to pre prep yourself for, right? Pillar number one is always the same, right? It's familiarization, right? Do I know my weapon? Do I know the ammunition, right? Um, can I draw it effectively, right? Reloading, uh, you know, just basically get a reloading procedure down and then work that up to where I can do it under pressure, on the move, that kind of thing, right? So that's all familiarization, right? Sighting. Uh, with sights, instinctive uh, sighting, all that kind of stuff, right? And then we have range time, right? So this is where most people stop with the gun training, okay? But pillars three and four are disarms and retention. Retention, because good Samaritan ally, whatever for him, right, might try to take this or keep it off of him or whatever, or he might, you're not going back to jail. So he just, you know, just does the thing. You know, the, the problem with a lot of people, again, there's that adolescent mindset. They don't think big enough, right? 
And the problem with this is, you know, I've got my gun out. He'd be stupid to jump me. Yeah. Well, if that has conditioned your, that belief has conditioned your uh, thinking and processing and awareness and all that kind of stuff, right? Then you're going to be surprised as hell when he jumps you. And even if you pull the trigger, it's got to hit him and it's got to hit him someplace where it's going to shut him down quickly. Right? So we have retention problems. Okay? And then the other thing are disarms. Well, yeah, but I'm carrying. I don't have to worry about disarms. Really? You turn the corner, he's got his gun in your face, and yours is still in the holster. Guess what? You have to operate like you're unarmed until you can get to yours. So, again, people don't think big enough, right? Or broadly enough, okay? And it's going to get him in trouble. I think I just um, did. I, I don't know if it was a post. I don't think I did a video. Uh, video. I think it was just a dry post about uh, success. And this was from a different mentor outside of the martial arts, right? Success has three broad base uh, pieces to it. Okay, their skill sets, their skill. Right. This is what most people who want to teach martial arts or run a dojo or whatever think that they're going to be successful on. Right. I'm a good martial artist, but if you're a crappy business person, right, you're not, you're not going to pay the rent for very long. Okay. But they confuse it too, just like doctors confuse the fact that they went to medical school and now they think they know everything about everything because of their position. Right. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Anyway, so you have your skill set, right? That's like one upright on, on a ladder, right? It's one, one side piece, right? Other side piece going up the other side, your character traits. Okay. So see, sometimes when I mention things like business, people automatically default to, well, business people, they they are manipulators, they're con men, you can't trust them, whatever, right? I'm sorry that your belief system is founded on being conned by unscrupulous people. Because I know a whole bunch of other ones that are ethical to a fault. And they get screwed over by clients and customers all the time because they don't want to be disliked. They don't want to be thrown into the same category. They would never want to be called uh, a used car salesman. Okay. So, and we'll get back to that little skewed thing there, right? But that's another upright, right? Your character traits, right? Your ethics, your morals, your uh, personal, uh, you know, uh, your decision-making abilities, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, character traits, right? But the rungs in the middle, right? That's your beliefs. Okay? Just like people believe that businessmen are. So, you know, I have to use words like instructor, whatever, right? I can never call myself the manager of the dojo, right? Or the owner of the dojo. Right. Master instructor, whatever. See, that makes everybody feel all warm and fuzzy. That's cool. Right. But if I'm the owner and I'm selling martial arts classes as opposed to enrolling you in a program. Right. So I've had to learn to speak, to listen, stay away from trigger words for people because. Right. What will happen is they'll screw themselves. They want to take martial arts, but then when they think they're being sold martial arts lessons, they'll shut down and back off and then never take action, right? But if, you know, somebody can say, hey, you know, come and join our group, right? Um, yeah, I just, I, you know, classes are this much per uh, per class or classes are this much or it's this much per month or whatever. People are like, oh, cool. Oh, okay. So um, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be um, enrolling into a program. Oh, okay, that's cool, right? Okay. Um, so the program that you want to purchase is, whoa, right? Beliefs, okay? Beliefs, by and large, get in people's way way more often than anything else. Their beliefs about themselves, their beliefs about the world, the beliefs about other people, their beliefs about the way they connect, those kind of things, right? That does it more often than not. Now, you got to have the other two sides as well, but more often than not, it's people's beliefs that get in the way, right? Same thing I've been talking about earlier on, right? Uh, with the, the first question and, and these other things, right? The belief that I can, I, you know, I'll, I'll eventually figure it out on my own. Well, you're absolutely right. Give it enough time, you'll figure it out on your own. 
Okay. But would it be faster if, okay, that's called a reframe. Okay. Would it be faster if you had somebody that's already worked it out and could at least give you part of it? And now you've, you know, you're on the right path, right? Now the figuring it out is more of a testing experimental kind of thing, as opposed to taking all that extra time ferreting out the answers and then testing them. Okay. So we've got to be careful with beliefs, right? Well, how many times I pointed out uh, in the videos or even in class, right? That fat old bald guy that's ahead, that's head of the school, seriously, the hell can he teach me? Well, that points to a belief system that if I'm not a certain build and I'm not a certain age and I'm not a certain, right? Seriously? Anyway, so, um, yeah. What else, James? Uh, this one's from Greg Beerley. How do you modulate ener energy and ability to perform in short, middle, and long-term cycles of improvement in the dojo, personally, etc. I've found spiking at high a level too early and applying too much energy can cause injuries, even though there is a capability to do this. For example, I wonder if stretching literally and figuratively would help, but then how much is too much? In ninjutsu, one can spike during drills and need to reset. Mm. Well, this is where my weird hobby, I would say I have weird hobbies, right? Where the weird hobbies come in, right? Um, where I've studied physiology and those kind of things. Not in a university setting, right? But how do I manage these things? And some, just like the previous answer I gave, came from other teachers. Like the energy spike uh, thing that I talk about when I'm dealing with somebody who's really good at grappling or... It doesn't matter. I had to maybe do a bunch of things, right? Took this guy down. Next thing I know, two of his friends come off of bar stools. Shit, right? So how do I how do I manage that stuff, right? If we're on at peak, like if we use the term, you know, uh, the, the code, right? A fire mode, right? You can only be in that mode for so long because you burn yourself out really, really quickly, right? So self-management, knowing where you are, right? Um, understanding, right? You don't have to know this stuff, but it helps, right? So understanding glycogen stores in the muscles and how that produces these energy spikes, right? But only so much as you're processing things with oxygen, because if you're not and the breathing rhythm is off, you produce a crap ton of lactic acid and then you get shut down because of cramps and dizziness and passing out and all kinds of wild, crazy stuff, right? So part of it's in balance, right? But part of it is in learning these other things that have nothing to do. Let me tell you, I'm going to say this differently because one of my teachers used to say this all the time. This thing that we're working on is not a self-defense technique, but it has everything to do with self-defense. Okay. Like when we're working on the drill Enundo, which is a circular repetition, defense to offense, offense to defense transition thing. You just keep going back and forth with your partner, back and forth, back and forth, over and over again, right? Uh, Senundo, right? It's just practicing evasion, right? Kamai to Kamai um, evasion, one attack after another, after another. You're just, right, getting really, really good at not getting hit, right? Um, we've got all these, all these drills, right? Senundo and Enundo are not self-defense techniques but they have everything to do with self-defense because they're either footwork or they're defense to offense, offense to defense transitions between the moves. They help you develop the piece between the index points that are written in the scrolls or the snapshots in the picture sequence or whatever, right? So it's the same thing, breathing, controlling breathing. Like we have a, uh, I was taught a cleansing breath, right? So you're going at it, whatnot, right? You feel things start to bog down. It could be because tension has your breathing shallow. Excuse me. So what ends up happening is you're not getting rid of the negative gases, right? <coughs> Excuse me, carbon dioxide, all that stuff, right? See, I'm getting all excited and my asthma is starting to kick in. So um, 
There we go. All right. So um, what ends up happening is things start to bog down, right? And if I let that condition stay and I stay in that close proximity, right, then it's just going to keep building, right? That turns into more and more muscle tension, right? That turns into more and more tunnel vision, all that stuff, right? So what we want to do is leap out. We want to you're going to bail out one way or the other, right? You're going to, you're going to uh, flank him, right? Move him, knock him away from you, create some distance, or you're going to roll away. You're going to leap away, whatever. And then from that distance, right? You're going to do this cleansing breath. The water breathing is long in fast out, right? Kind of like an ocean wave, big draw up and then crashes in, right? Um, so there's this cleansing breath. So you do a couple of those, whatever he gives you time for, right? It's not really giving you time, right? He's just trying to figure out how he's going to get the hell back in there on you through your come eye. So, <laughs> right, that kind of thing, because what I'm doing is I'm forcing all those negative gases out and getting oxygen back in, I'm taking a couple of deep breaths and shoving all this crap that's inhibiting everything back out again, right? Being able to manage those energy spikes right? The glycogen stores that have about a seven to 11 second burn, depending on the size of your muscles and all that kind of stuff, right? So you, you can only go fast and hard for a couple of seconds before you burn them and your body goes into a kind of a, a, a transition state to go from burning sugar to burning fat. You don't have time for that, right? So what I'm going to have to do is rest certain areas of my body, um, to let those things kind of uh, reset, right? Because it's going to take another 7 to 11 seconds for the body to put it back so that you can burn it again, right? Sprinters know this stuff. For people that do uh, running, right, uh, they'll do wind sprints, but they can only go full bore, right? Depends on the person, right? 5 to 11 seconds, give or take. And then they got to go back to either quick walking or jogging or whatever, and then they hit that point where they, they can feel it and they can go again, right? It's the same thing. So one of the benefits of this relaxed natural movement that we're using is there's only tension occurring just as I'm delivering the strike or just as I'm, you know, kicking the leg out to take him down for a throw or, you know, putting him into a, into a restraint. I'm not full body burning this stuff off. So what that does is it rations out in bursts, right, in smaller bursts this tension and overexertion, right? I want to manage the breathing. I want to, so again, you know, self-awareness, that kind of thing, right? It takes some time to get that happening, but it's also care of the battery as well, right? Care of the battery as well. So um, making sure that the diet that I have, it doesn't have to be extreme. It doesn't have to be, you know, whatever, right? but it should provide the nutrients that your body needs to maintain the battery because the condition of the battery, right? Think about a rechargeable battery. The condition of the battery determines how long and how, well, how much of what is taught as, or what's marketed as a full charge, right? How much of that is still capable and how quickly that battery will drain. The older it gets, the more, uh, you know, the more abuse it's taken, right? Whatever, right? Doesn't charge as much and it will discharge faster. We're no different, right? So keeping our minerals up, not just our vitamins, right? Our minerals up, making sure that uh, magnesium and calcium and those kind of things are what they're supposed to be, not just for bone density and stuff like that. The magnesium, is it magnesium or manganese? I think it's magnesium, right? Is responsible for over 350 different chemical processes in your body. So if your magnesium is low, guess that's what guess what's not happening or happening properly. All the chemical things that your body needs to be doing that depend on magnesium. Right? Lots of people take calcium supplements, but I learned that calcium gets processed by the body only in certain forms, like calcium that's delivered certain ways, right? Certain forms of calcium, like calcium carbonate, like Tums, right? this antacid kind of thing here in the States. I don't, know if, I don't know if it's all over the place or not. Right. But um, right there in the package, a good source of calcium, 
Yeah, just because you're putting calcium in your body, it's not soluble. So people that half chew their calcium or you know, swallow the whole calcium tablets, they've taken x-rays of these people, right? And you can watch them go through the GI tract and come right back out the other end. They don't dissolve at all, okay? Calcium carbonate, calcium citrate, right? Says still calcium, right? But if we don't know what the body, anyway, I'm not, this is not a health thing and I'm not a doctor, so um, do the same study. Or find somebody who has and go based on that, all right? But a lot of this has to do with, you know, breathing and care and whatever. The other thing, too, is that in training, we tend to go farther and longer than we will probably have to go on the street. Okay. And that's okay. But be careful following the fight science or whatever of these guys who are trying to be champions in the ring where they've got to last for multiple two minute or multiple five minute rounds with only a short rest in between. Okay. Nobody's going to ring a bell and give you an extra, right? So it's in our best interest to learn how to do this stuff so that we only need to be on for a short amount of time. It needs to be quick. It needs to be quick for for the any combatant anyway, because you don't know if another one's coming right behind him. Okay? People want to get into freaking fist fights like they're still in high school, pushing and shoving and all that kind of crap, right? In an actual self defense situation, it's too easy for somebody to come up behind you, smack you in the head with a freaking pipe or a bottle or whatever, shoot you in the back. Okay? I don't care what country you're from, right? There's lots of countries that where guns are illegal and criminals have guns or knives or whatever, right? So anyway, uh, hopefully that helped, right? But I, I would recommend, you know, doing some uh, study and research on um, the, the energy and all that. And I don't get into the metaphysics of things too much because often people want to come in it from, come at it from that direction. But again, the battery uh, sucks. Right. So I, I, I don't again, this is my belief thing. So I may be shortcutting myself, but I've come at things from both sides. And ultimately, as a human being, everything's grounded in the physical and then it moves out from there. Right. Got the physical body, the psychic body, the uh, different names for these different things. Right. But there's the three body kind of thing. There's the different chakras. Number seven plugs into the universal energy, all that kind of stuff, right? So I get it, but right, our health and our physical state, our our, our wellness, right, our well-being um, affects that a lot. Anyway, what else, James? Uh, <clears throat> Lee had Looks like more of a comment. I a mindset I have encouraged in my training is the either or mentality when it comes to training. Not proud of that. I'm getting the idea that I can have both. Your cue in on problem versus solution mindset introduced me to the actual wording that I needed. Oh, cool. Yeah, one of my problems is um, sometimes my multifaceted thinking and perspective can create, um, what do they call that? Uh, paralysis through analysis. Because I can see multiple routes and multiple perspectives at the same time, right? Um, I, have a, I have a difficult time sometimes picking one because often they all have the same priority or the same effectiveness level, right? So again, this goes back to that, that thing that I, I let off with, right? With, the, with one student, um, you naturally default to this thing. Well, how do I work on both at the same time? Well, I have to know that this is my default and I have to be mindful that when I go to jump into that, I have to remember, don't forget, practice this as well. 
And if we treat mental faculties the same way we treat physical uh, uh, physical development, right? Um, you always work the weak side first, and then you don't do the strong side any more reps than you did the weak side. Otherwise, you'll grow one big leg and one small leg and walk in circles. <laughs> so I may jump onto this, but because it's my default, that's going to be easier, right? And the rule of time management and effectiveness in that direction is you always do the hard task first, get them out of the way, which is usually the stuff nobody wants to do. So I'll flip gears. So when when I'm when that multiplicity thing kicks in, right? Um, if they all look from this perspective, if they all look even, I have to remind myself, then pick one. If no one is any more important or any looks any more effective than any other one, right? Because I once I can see them, right, then my brain does this little karmic kind of thing where I recognize what this will lead to what that will lead, that kind of thing, right? It's just Mikio training 505. Anyway, and then based on the time I have to, to make that decision, then if there's if there's one or two set winners, I'll just pick one and go because I can make adjustments on the fly, right? But if they're all even, I have to remind myself, then pick one. Because if I don't, I'll, I'll stay in analysis too long and nothing's getting done. Okay. So, uh, like I stopped making videos uh, on YouTube and training things for quite a while because, you know, I don't have time to make it right. My the camera's old. And, all, and here I am walking around with a freaking Samsung S21 kind of thing with a camera that's better than any freaking camera I've ever, you know, like video camera I've ever had. Right. I don't need one. <coughs> and anybody that's worried about nice production value and titles and music and all that kind of stuff, how much are they actually going to be training? Right? Because most of my students just give a shit about the lesson. Right? I had to get my head wrapped around that, and now I'm just like kicking this stuff out. Right? The other day I shot uh, nine, nine YouTube shorts um in the course of an hour and 15 minutes right then quick editing get those things up quick editing get those things up right that kind of thing and then the next day i shot nine more right and the next day i was going to shoot nine more but i got to thinking about like I, I had to edit those things yet and so then these other ideas popped up um and what i used to do was just make notes okay do it on this do it on this and so now what i'm reminding myself is you got the idea in your head, you're shooting a one minute or less video for this particular thing, right? Summarize it and tell it, just turn your damn camera on, and do it now. Okay. Now it's at least done. And I can, now all it's going to take is bring that up, throw it in the editor, right? And the editor that I now have on my phone will post it directly to YouTube, directly to TikTok, directly to Instagram, whatever, right? I, I had to just, First thing I had to do was recognize my own um, my own processes that slowed success, slowed results. Okay. And it wasn't the camera. It wasn't time. It wasn't anything. It was me thinking that it had to be a certain way. And while I'm waiting for perfection or the best time or whatever, I'm not getting the lessons out there. But what is happening is my list of video topics kept growing. And now, which one do I do first? Which one do I? Now I'm not worried about it. Just toss it out there. Right? So it's kind of like when I was writing my articles. And I ended up with, what, over 600 articles? James, is that right? 500, 600 articles or whatever on that easingarticles.com. Something like that, right? I wrote those in the course of two years. I mean, it slowed down, but there was a period where I was cranking out um, three to five articles a day. Right. So, uh, what Clint Eastwood say in Magnum Force: "A man's got to know his limitations." You woe man's too. Okay. So, uh, got to know our limitations. 
and then if you in the time it takes to fix the limitation you could have come up with five different workarounds okay. so simultaneously we're working on adaptive mindset and problem solving while we're doing all this stuff okay. and when it comes to implementation it's speed to results that matter because you can always make adjustments along the way, right? Once you produce a certain set of results, and you'll you'll know as soon as you produce the results where it's missing some things, where it's lacking, where there's too much of one thing, less of another. Make some adjustments. It's just like when you step back into come by. You'll know if you're too far away, too close, or whatever. So do another little half step or whatever, or adjust. Or the next time you have to move, don't move as far or move farther or whatever, right? Just like in a fight, you're going to have to adjust on the fly. Okay. And while we're all perfectionists, I'm a pragmatist. And done is better than perfect sometimes. I know we want to fully understand things, but while we're waiting for the fullness of understanding, Our skill sets waiting for us to actually put it into use. Done is better than perfect. Anyway, anything else? Uh, since a golem threw out, what would you say is the most common or basic thing that people should do to improve their taijutsu and or ukemi? Uh, make a list of skills and um, uh, focus on the things that you don't like first. Everybody likes to practice the stuff they're already good at or the stuff they like. Meanwhile, there's a butt ton of skills that are going, they're either non-existent or, well, I think I've seen that once or twice in class or, um, they're degrading. I don't mean like they're calling you names. I mean, they're falling apart, right? Um, because nobody wants to work on the things that, and this I got from Shoshin Malmstrom. Uh, God help you if you ever ask him what he thought you needed to work on. Because uh, if he didn't just flat out tell you because he knew what you were avoiding, he'd look at you and go, what don't you like to do? Start there. Uh, and once you got used to that, and so, you know, ego is really quick to jump to the answer so that you're not completely wrong, right? Okay. So what do I need to work on? And I know you're going to tell, and he'll go, no, no, no. I want you to look farther back than that. What do you dislike so much? It's not even on your list. You don't even want to think about it. It's that distasteful. So that's one side. The other answer, John, which is a much shorter answer, okay? Um, know that any one thing that you could get good at will affect your skill sets globally, right? So the keyhole, new keyhole, whatever. I mean, you could work on a cot there or whatever, but small pieces, right? Um, and uh, work on one thing until I would say until you can't get it wrong, but let's not go that far, right? Because people don't like to do the hard stuff and they, they don't like to do things for too long, right? Um, don't, tr don't go after something else or don't change anything until you can do that skill. And this is again, something, you know this, cause you started training with me in 89. So I was only out of the military for less than a year when you and I met, right? So you got the, brunt of things that I got from like 1980 up, right? Um, what we were taught was you get a skill. I don't care if it's moving the Kamai with a counter strike or each emotional cop, whatever it is, right? You start slowly, you work on it step by step, and then you keep picking up the speed till you find where flow gets jammed up, timing gets jammed up, whatever, right? 
and then it wasn't there. It's one step back. So back up, go through that, find where the problem is, right? Fix that. Now you can pick up speed. Your goal is to get to 80% of full speed or better and the technique correct eight or nine out of 10 times correctly before you go swapping that out for something else. But people don't do that. They practice this, then they practice that, then they practice that, then they practice that, and they get that they stay perpetually a white belt. I don't care what the belt color around the waist is, right? They're not, we're not working something to, until it gets integrated, right? The, the code word that my teacher, uh, my first teacher used was until you own it. It needs to go from something you do to something you own, and you own it when it's in subconscious storehouse when it's in muscle memory which science has figured is the same thing right muscle memory is your subconscious which begets the question are brain transplants really possible when we've only given different names to different things right this is just the biggest nodule in the whole system your brain goes out to everything right? so Anyway, um, pick something okay? and work it until you can do it at, at least 80% full speed, eight to nine times out of 10 without screwing it up. Because until then, you don't own it. You're still doing it. You own something like most of you drive, I'm assuming. So, you know, you see somebody's about to not stop or a pedestrian about to step, you know, step off the curb, uh, whatever, right? And you don't even think about, I need to slow the car. I need to stop the car. Nothing like that, right? You go, <gasps> right? There's this gasp or there's this tightening up of muscles. And before you even know what happened, your foot moved from the accelerator to the brake. That's owning something. Where you and the car are one. That's what I was taught the goal was. That's what I've always aimed for. That's what I was always being critiqued on. Okay? Because as long as we're doing it, as long as we have to think about it while we're doing it, right? It's too slow. It's not going to be effective. And it, it it, it might be, right? What's that old saying? Uh, most of you that are young and, and only know digital clocks, this is not going to make any sense, right? But the analog clock with the hands and all that, right? The saying used to be a broken clock is right at least twice a day. Right? So you could luck out, still win with your stuff. Okay? Doesn't make it what it's supposed to be. Oh, and don't confuse winning a fight with winning the fight using this alone, which was our litmus test growing up. That was our litmus test for getting secondary black belt. The teacher, and I still use that for my students. I have to believe that a student will, can win a fight against the average attacker on the street, which means somebody just blowing a gasket, having an anger management issue, not some kind of trained martial artist or trained killer, right? The average attacker on the street, right? They can win with Budo Ninpo Taijutsu alone without falling back on something else. That has no bearing over whether or not they could win a fight at all. Right? Anybody could win a fight. But are you using the science that you're supposed to be supposedly learning, right, to make that easier, quicker, more efficient, more effective, those kind of things? Because we're all wired for caveman style. Next. <clears throat> Carl threw out in reference to Greg's question, I have found conditioning is important, but practicing breathing techniques to counteract the effects are important, has enabled me to spar with people much younger than me and enables staying in conscious mode rather than in panic mode. Big time. Yeah. Being able to control your nerves is huge. Okay. Because 
people people think about you know getting winded and, and the body getting tired and all that kind of stuff but your brain can get not just fatigued right you can be you can be over firing and nothing is focused right so uh, yeah controlling distance all that kind of stuff right and and what's that i know it's i know it's become a cliche because everybody keeps saying it right i wrote an ebook that uh, had this name a bunch of years ago and all that, right? Fight smarter, not harder. Okay. That involves a whole bunch of things that people, you know, um, they, they don't give much thought to, right? If I'm controlling my breath, if I'm like, if I, if there's distance between he and I, even for a second or three before he starts closing the gap again, I want to relax as many things as I can that I don't need in the moment because I'm not protecting anything. Right. So I want to I want and I want to protect practice doing that because I'm going to have to remember under pressure. But if I can relax those things, I speed up the glycogen restoration. Right. And so I'm managing these energy spikes. I'm, and if I can manage those things, um, the better I'm going to be. Knowing what to look for, um, you'll find that. People that are a higher level, and I don't mean belt, I mean proficiency, higher level, it always seems like they know just what to do, right? They're not just throwing something out there, like they're always in the right position, right? A lot of that has to do with um, like researching other fight styles, just the experience of doing Ronduri training and all that, right? And you're not watching the fist and the feet so much because after a while, you will have ducked so many different punches and kicks and grabs and whatnot <coughs> that that's not what you're watching anymore, right? It start you start to follow the trail backwards, and you you start to recognize when the shoulder starts to move a certain way, or the hips start to move a certain way, or whatever, right? And that gives you a clue as, as to what's coming, right? The way they hold their body, right? Are are the fist like right in front? of the body in front of the face in front of the chest that kind of thing signaling this person's probably going to be a straight puncher or a straight grabber does that mean he won't throw a hook no but if he throws a hook god you're going to see that you're going to see his chest open up and you're, you start picking up on these things right um same thing with kickers and all that right you start to read these things um that's why like between our third and fourth dawn kind of thing right um for fourth dawn um, what people end up doing is, and this is not the bad thing, this is what I'm looking for, right? They know where the attacker will be when he gets where he's going with any particular punch, grab, kick, or whatever, right? So instead of responding to it, defending against it, and then moving in, they slip into the hole and they meet him, right? They already know where he's going to be when he gets where he's going, okay? Not the punch, not the kick, whatever, where the where the computer's going to be, right? Where the fuel pump's going to be. And they just move into that position, okay? But see, before that, second to third done, we're looking for, can we push the buttons on him to get him to do what we want that feeds our technique. And before that, can we go with the flow that whatever he's doing, it's okay with me, right? Before that, do I know how to do the damn moves if the opportunity pops up, right? So that I'm not floundering around and guessing or just throwing a bunch of shit around and hoping for the best kind of thing, right? Each one of these things, now I just reverse engineered it, but each one, each successive or each previous one is necessary for the next piece, the next piece, the next piece, right? So then we hit fifth on, right? Everybody knows about the fifth on test, right? What is that? Well, it's the gateway to a whole other perceptual being, right? So I don't even have to watch his body. I just get a sense about him and I know when he's going to go, when he's getting ready, whatever. I may not know what he's going to throw, but I know when he's about to go because most people lead with intent before their body goes. So 
this perception gets broader, but not because I'm trying to work on it, because I'm doing these other things, these other lower level skills that build to that till eventually I'm not looking at his body anymore, I'm looking at his eyes or I'm, you know, I'm just getting a sense for, cause I'm plugged in, right? I recognize this fight is a relationship. It's a negative relationship, but it's a relationship. Just like boyfriend, girlfriend, just like husband, wife, just like best friends, whatever, right? I know those are on the positive side, but when you're when you you have that kind of connection, right? Parent to child, whatever, you have that kind of connection. You can almost finish people, each other's sentences. You start to you think about the same joke at the same time, whatever, right? You you just you're operating almost like you're one person. Well, you can plug into a stranger that way, or at least on an energy level, because they're projecting intent. And you're the receiver. When you can do that, oh, right? But the, the thing is, people find out about that level and then they want to go all woo-woo and work on that, but they can't do more base level things. Was it this previous camp, James, where I demonstrated um, uh, telekinesis? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just briefly mentioned it, right? And I looked at one of the students. I said, hey, can you hand me that pen? And they brought it over to me, right? And I said, if you can't do that, because did I move that thing across the room without touching it? Yes. But people go, oh, see, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, no, but if you can't do that, how the hell are you going to move it from one part of the table to another and nobody's touching it? But people want to start with the woo-woo. How about if I start by producing results in the world by many different means and recognizing that this is a building of skill sets because each of the Kuji is an end result of a bunch of skill sets that you work on. You don't work on the end result. The end result is the pr product of doing the right type of training that produces that thing. Okay. And own your mistakes. Stop doing shit that you stop avoiding things you don't like because it makes you look bad or you get frustrated or whatever, right? And stop gravitating to the things you do well, right? You're just making for more unbalance, okay? How the hell do you fix things? Anybody's ever been to school? I remember high school, university, whatever, right? I don't remember half, I, I don't remember 99.8% of the questions on all the tests I've ever had. But all the mistakes I made, and had to restudy that thing to get it right on the re retest. Oh, I'll never forget those. Right? We study to fix our mistakes at least three times harder than we study the stuff that we're natural at. But not if we don't allow ourselves to make mistakes. Okay. How, would, how do you know a technique? How do you know an approach? How do you know that ninjutsu is the best option or a really good option unless you've tried to break it or anything that you're studying? Most people approach things like a disciple, like a zealot, right? It's got, what's happening, though, for ego is I've chosen this and I've determined it's right. And now I have to defend it to my death. Because it has to be right. I'm so vested in it that it has to be right. You'll never know if something works well unless you make mistakes along the way or do what me and a couple of my peers did for about a year. Go around and work with other people and try to break it. Okay. Anyway, um, we're like... I've got time for like a really short one if there's one more. The only other question in here right now is from Lee. What are some practical applications for Ninja no Uge in a modern context? What do you do for a living? I think I know, but you might have changed your your job. I know you have your um, uh, rule of survival stuff that you teach, but what else?
whatever that is, right? How do you get people to do it? How do you get people to work on a particular skill? Right? He's, Don't think he about the, he's, the manipulation part. Think about influence. What's that? He said he's a para pro with a special need in a high school. Awesome. Huh? Um, so if I don't know the cognitive level of the students and that's okay, right? Um, how do you get the parents to do things? I would, I would highly recommend that everybody go and study, um, uh, get a, a book or three on sales. I know you hate that stuff. Well, I'm not trying to sell anything. If you're trying to get somebody to buy an idea that you have or go along with an idea or suggestion that you have or do things your way or whatever, you are absolutely selling. You're just not or transacting money for an object or money for a service. But you are conveying value of something in a way that that other person would want to take or do that thing. Right? I know I've suggested this before. I think it was in the context of a coup den, right? Find the book by Robert Cialdini called Influence. Start there because all the, those seven areas that are in there were not made up. We are social creatures. We are mammals and group creatures. Those things developed to operate as a functional contributing member of a clan. They're hardwired into our brains. Understand them and then start to look for practical applications for triggering them in other people. Okay. The difference between influence and manipulation on a very, very gross level is manipulation is seen as negative by most people because it sounds underhanded. I'm making them do things. Influence, right? I'm explaining things in a way that gets them to see the proper thing. The other thing you could study is neuro-linguistic programming, NLP. Just get some base um, studies on things because you want to understand rapport building. At a minimum, these three things, rapport building, preframe, reframes, those are the same things, but a preframe is they don't have any, uh, they don't have an opinion one way or the other about a given thing that they're, that you're approaching them with. So you're going to preframe them on it, right? Okay. So a preframe for somebody, let's say I'm teaching people Onikudaki for the first time. Okay. In class, I would say, okay, we're going to, we're going to work on this technique. Um, it can be a little bit confusing to get it first because of where the body parts and all that go, right? So I'm being very honest about it, right? Uh, about where the body parts go. But once you get this, right, it doesn't matter if you apply pressure or they resist, it will unscrew their shoulder joint, okay? And most people's will to fight will be broken, not just their shoulder. That's a preframe. A reframe is somebody comes to me, I say, we're going to work on a new and I'm like, oh, I suck at that one. Okay, I get it. This is a very, very challenging technique. I get it, right? But let's take a look at where things are and make sure that you know where it's supposed to be because we might be missing something, okay? Because once you get that little thing and we can fix it, you'll be able to X, Y, Z, okay? So rapport building, that means they think that you and them are similar, right? Rapport building is not, hey, how's the weather? Okay. It's not just being friendly. It's getting the other person to associate with you as though you are like-minded. Your life experiences are the same, that kind of thing, right? It can start with just being nice and getting somebody to speak because now you've got a connection, but you can take it beyond that, right? So um, basic three for now, um, rapport building, preframe reframes, and your choice. Pattern interrupts or locator questions, okay? A pattern interrupt is disrupting somebody's thought processes so that you can start clean. I use pattern interrupts when I'm going to, um, I'm getting ready to enroll somebody into, into the programs and I have to describe it. So it's going to sound like a sales pitch or whatever. Um, but here's the thing. People come into the martial arts school to enroll in martial arts classes and then we start talking about which program they're going to get into and defense mechanisms go up because they're afraid I'm going to sell them martial arts classes. Okay. So I have to get around that. Right. So no matter how long we've been talking, right. 
get together to do this. As we start to do it, as we get closer to that point, these things start to trigger. And what I do is I go, so how long have you lived in the area? Or what do you do for a living again? Or what school does he go to? Resets everything. And now I can start the process because the way my scripts are laid out is they're laid out in a way that makes sure I lead somebody logically step by step the way the, the problem solving function on our brain works. It gives me a chance to do a clean slate. You could do it if you had to talk to a parent about their kid messing up again, or maybe they've got Tourette's and they, you know, whatever, okay? Um, or whatever it is, right? Um, you can reset them. So that's that's a that's a uh, uh, pattern interrupt. A locator question is something that I ask to find out where somebody is in their mind about something already. An example of that that I use on a regular basis is um, somebody calls the dojo and they want to know about martial arts classes and all that. But then they say, do you guys spar? Okay. Most people will just have a snap answer. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Or they'll go into a long diatribe, right? Well, we don't really call it sparring. We call it Rondori. And it's a da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
if I have the time, I'll, I'll get answers out to you, uh, that kind of thing. But anyway, we've been at this for a couple minutes short of two hours. So anyway, uh, there were more questions than I thought there would be. And that's kudos to everybody. So um, if nothing else, take control of your training. Don't abdicate to anybody, including the teacher, right? You're choosing the teacher that you think best at whatever time, money, whatever commitment you can afford that best connects, right? And that you trust will get you where you need to go, right? But ultimately, you're responsible for your own training. Your teacher is not responsible for your training. Your teacher is responsible for conveying the lessons as authentically as possible, as authentically as they can do it, right? Um, to, to make sure it gets passed on, right? But that, their responsibility stops there. Their job is not to make sure you're trained. Their job is to make sure, not, sure, not to make sure you learn, okay? It does include making sure that you comprehend what they said or what they demonstrated. Okay. Any teacher that says, well, I understood what I said. I'm, half the class understood what I meant. It's not my fault that he didn't understand. Yes, it is. Because who the hell are you teaching to if you're not making sure that the student gets it? Okay. Anyway. All right. Cool. James, as always, thank you very much for your help. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody who had questions, comments. Uh, some of you guys that are on, um, I mean, whether you ask a question or not, I hope everybody got value out of this. And if you're listening to this long after the episode is over, um, I hope that this gave you lots of value. I like doing these things every once in a while because sometimes people want to ask certain questions, but they don't because they, I don't know, they don't want to ask what they think might be a stupid question. They don't want people to laugh at them like they should have known that. Um, oh, and by the way, I do not buy into the cliche that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Yes, there is. Okay. Um, but if you, if you don't know and you feel like you should know, that's not a stupid question. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I haven't pulled the Hatsumi Sensei thing yet. Like, don't ask me a question that you haven't already started the research on. And you're confused about something that came up during your research. Okay. That's what Stephen Hayes had to put up with back in the day. Um, I didn't, I didn't get that directly, but I was standing next to one of my friends who asked that during a seminar. Sensei, what do you think about X, Y, Z martial art? <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> oh, man, most people are used to Hatsumi Sensei just smiling and yeah, whatever, da, 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 whatever. You know, man, just. Eyes just bored into my friend. Sensei, you know, about my height, and my friend was <laughs> six three, six four, something like that. Just bored into his eyes. Right? Don't you ever ask me a question like that again without doing your research or whatever. You come at me with a question, you be specific. Okay. And then he looked around the room and said, You see him and him and him and her? You see them? And I expect questions like that from them. Not from you. Don't you ever ask me a question like that again. Okay. So I never ask a question like that because <laughs> I caught it indirectly, right? Um, but, you know, it is what it is, right? So, uh, but know what your job is as a student. But also remember, right? This is your path, your life. You need certain results. You need to certain abilities and skill sets, right? Make sure you're getting them. Okay? All these things will bring up certain questions, right? And if you're actually working on things, more questions will come up than if you're not. The amount of questions come up in direct proportion to the amount of work you're doing. Because okay? you're going to hit more walls. You're going to hit more frustration. You're going to hit more points of... Um, uh, where there's a gap in understanding. Okay. Uber successful people fail way more often than everybody else. 
Nobody believes that because all they ever see is the successes. In a given year, a successful, an uber successful person, I don't care if it's an athlete, business person, whatever, right? They start five, 12, 22 projects and very quickly find where there's problems and all that kind of stuff. And But they throw as many things into the cauldron as possible to find those two that really take off. And then they stop everything else and triple and quadruple down on those things that are working. Michael Jordan confused being a really good basketball player with being a good athlete overall. Some of you guys remember this, right? Left left basketball and took up what? Baseball. And he sucked at baseball to the same degree that he was fantastic at basketball. And what did Michael Jordan do within the first year? Went back to basketball. Okay. But you don't find that out unless you're doing a bunch of stuff. Okay? And here's the thing. You don't need extra practice time. Life is your freaking laboratory. Life is your dojo. Practice your skills in real time. I don't mean doing Ichimonji no Kata in the middle of your work floor. Okay? You practice your walking. Practice your communications. Practice your observation skills. Right? All kinds of things. Right? You can be practicing stretching whatever, wherever you happen to be. Right. Oh, and uh, Greg Beerley, stretching should come. Modern uh, sports science has shown that stretching should come after the workout. What comes before the workout is warm up. When people show up for class and they've been driving for 15 minutes, hour and a half, whatever, right? My guys get changed, and I don't know if they mean to or not, but they meander around the dojo. And these little chats will just keep on moving, or they'll lightly do some practice with each other before class gets starts. That's a warm up. Get the muscles moving, that kind of stuff. Get the blood pumping, breathing, that kind of stuff, right? Warm up the body. And the warm up should be you're doing light exercise, right? Consistent enough to get the body to a point where you feel like your breathing's going to start to pick up and you might start sweating. That's a warm up. Uh, stretching is part of a cool down because you're trying to clear out stuff, right? Especially lactic acid and all that, that can cause cramps and slow down the healing process and all that kind of stuff later. My guys tend to just lick their bruises and go, <laughs> go, <laughs> go home. <laughs> anyway, James, did you have anything to throw on this top, top, on top of this fire? No, sir. Well, hell, how are you how are you ever going to replace me doing this if you don't uh, speak up? I appreciate you head knowing me. I'm not going to live forever. All right. Anyway, that's it. We're going to wrap this up. Um, I don't know. I'm open to topic suggestions for next week. Okay. I know most of you are just going to forget and wait to see whatever I come up with. Well, we'll see. Anyway, well, I don't want to be the only one ever asking questions. Well, why not? Well, you know, other people might feel bad or they might think that I'm like hogging time. Be greedy. They're not going to do it. Why are you wasting your opportunities because somebody, you, you're thinking that other people are going to ask questions? 98% of them are not going to ask any questions. Ask the questions. They'll be thankful you did. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, everyone. I will see you next time on Kuden. Get more of Kuden Radio. Subscribe through your favorite podcasting site or join our clan of serious modern warriors at onlineninjaacademy.com.